Hello and welcome back to another episode of the First Issue Club, the weekly comic book show that talks about what? That's right, the first issues of the week. I am your co-host, Greg, and with me is my dear, dear friend, Andy Vargas. Andy, what's up, what's up, what's up? Oh, coming in hot. <laughs> You know, I got to bring that morning zoo. Got to bring that morning (laughs) zoo energy, baby. Like a little alarm or cowbell or something. You came in, you were like hot dog. That's that's your new morning zoo name, hot dog. (laughs) It's Greg and the hot dog. It's hot dog in the bun coming to you live (laughs) on ninety eight point nine, the slab. (laughs) Hell yes. Uh, hey everyone, we usually don't do that, and we never will again. Um, it is me <laughs> Kirk until and next Andy, week, as you said, as we said earlier. Um, Mike D is out this week and possibly next week. He is at LA Comic Con. Um, we are just green with jealous rage that he is traveling uh, right now to LA Comic Con. He will be in beautiful weather, surrounded by beautiful comic books, and um, I hope he gets a splinter. To be honest. I hope he has just a little tiny inconvenience because I so badly want to be him right now. Uh, I think he is already experiencing the maximum amount of displeasure that Mike D can experience because he has to transport his pleasure, his treasures from Mm -hmm. Kansas city to LA and then back. Yeah. If I know my little stressful guy, like I, like I think I do, uh, he's very, uh, worried about his little corners of his books and whether or not they'll get dented and dinged on the commute there. Yeah. So thoughts and prayers with Mike D and his collection as he travels during this hectic time. That's right. Oh, poor uh, Mike. There's a lot of there's a lot of cool artists and creators going to be there at LA Comic Con. So hopefully he takes some videos and pictures and we'll post them over on the Patreon. Speaking of Patreon. We just got done recording a pretty unique episode of the Patreon. We did kind of like a live show where we had an audience participation during the show where we got to talk with uh, fans of First Issue Club. And I know it's a small amount, but they were there. Um, And so we got to talk about the 10 best-selling comic books of all time, uh, which comic book writer has the most annoying fan base. You know, uh, we did a, a Mount Rushmore. It was really, really cool. We're really grateful that uh, the those people showed up and, and made the episode so much more fun. Uh, so if you want to go check that out, go to patreon.com slash first issue club. It will be in the free section because this will be the first episode of the month. Um, the first and last episodes of each month, you will get a free episode of first issue club um, if you join. And we have two tiers of of paid membership you have the just a taste tier which is one dollar and then you get full flavored which is four dollars and you get articles videos uh audio episodes all kinds of crazy stuff so um go check it out we have a lot of stuff there for you guys to to enjoy it's great for christmas if you're looking for a a unique christmas gift to give someone this year give them a first issue club membership over on the patreon they'll love it um, we're, we're cheaper than Disney Plus, and we don't have ads. We're cheaper than most comic books. <laughs> True. Books. And we talk about them, so we, we tell you which ones to get. That's right. Uh, so we're your go-to spot for the hot gossip on comic books and, and to help you spend your money wisely, we'll say. Um, what else? Uh, quick plug for all our social media. We're on every platform you can think of. Uh, that's it. I mean... You, you name it, we're on it. Um, today we're going to be covering, I think, four or five books on the show. Uh, some from this week and some from last week because we uh, didn't have a show last week for Thanksgiving. We premiered our Ed Brubaker interview, which I am still trying to get over. It was phenomenal to talk to him for as long as we did. And he was so generous with his time. And he was really open with like his process and like what he's been through in the comic book industry. We got to talk about um, SoCal punk rock for a little bit, which was great for me in my (laughs) world. It kind of threw me for a loop. Um, But if you want to go check the previous episodes, it's back there. Ed Brubaker talking about his new book with Sean Phillips, where the body was. Um, It's also on YouTube. It is on YouTube. Yeah. We need to start mentioning that we have more and more of our episodes are now being recorded 
and so they're going to be up on YouTube. I think you just go to YouTube and type in First Issue Club, slam that subscribe button, tickle that like button, and while you're there, <laughs> ring that bell. <laughs> did I do that right? Is, that, is you, that how they do it? You did it perfectly. Bam. What do you know? Look at me. Old dog learning new tricks. Um, <laughs> before we get into comic books, some comic book news we're going to go over. Some happy, some sad. Sure. Um, on a personal note, we have KC TowerCon coming up here at the end of December, which we'll be covering uh, exclusively on the show. And then in April or no March, we'll be doing Planet Comic Con in Kansas City. Where we'll be doing some special coverage of that con as well. Um, on to the news. Avengers Incorporated has been canceled. So the, dumb. The book by Al Ewing and Leonard Kirk, which Andy, you and I both loved this book yeah. so, so much. It was such a unique take and like the artwork was phenomenal. Um, unfortunately, the penultimate issue, issue number five, will be de- debuting in December due to, according to Tom Brevert, low readership. That Which, sucks, man. <laughs> we're going to have to take Tom's word for it because no comic publisher releases numbers on how our books are selling. So uh, I wish there was some more transparency with that, but that is a battle we are still fighting. So yeah. um, rest in peace to Avengers Incorporated. Man, you were loved while you were here. That sucks, too, because that was such a fresh book. Like It was a superhero like Law & Order. You know, mm-hmm. like murder mystery. Ugh, so good. And you know what, Andy? It just solidifies my my thinking. People don't want new. <laughs> True. With Marvel and DC, listen, we've made the tread. Stay in the goddamn tread. Don't make it fun. Make it familiar. Put Batman in that book, goddammit. <laughs> such a bummer. It's such, it's such a bummer that new and innovative... Writing and art isn't accepted so readily yeah. within the, the big two publishers. For in, sure. In, in our humble opinion. Uh, next up, Andy, you know more about this one than I do. I guess there's going to be a Joker year one Yeah, from Chip Sadarsky writing and illustrating. Is this a solo book or is it within the Batman book he's currently writing? So it's issues 142 through 144. Mm-hmm. that he's doing within the current Batman run. Um, and it's, it's the same team though. He's, he's writing it, but uh, Giuseppe Camolo Coley, whatever the, mm-hmm. the guy who is drawing Batman is still drawing it. And then I think Andrea Sorrentino is doing covers. Yes. For yes, that yes, series. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, the de- apparently the definitive origin of the Joker, and there is some seriously haunting uh, preview art that Starsky did. Cover right now that is that is just unnerving. Yeah, are you looking at the one, the Secrets of Chaos? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, it is creepy as hell. Uh, but it's got me jazzed. Uh, I hope they put that out as a like a variant cover because that's the one to get. Well, this is such a, this is such a big deal. You know what I mean? Like we don't really know too much about the Joker and that's by design really. Right. Because the less you know about evil, the scarier it becomes. And so I don't really know how much they're going to do in these two to three issues. That's really going to humanize or, you know, kind of expose any really big secrets of this character, but the fact that they're they're allowed and are and being able to explore a little bit is um is really kind of cool. Yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see um how close this gets to like killing joke. Um because that's I think historically like the quote unquote definitive Joker origin book. Mm-hmm. Um, but even that doesn't really, you know, it, it leaves a lot up in the air. Um, you know, it's, is it in Canon? Is it out of Canon? Um, it's, it's pretty wild to me to see them just like straight up calling it Joker year zero and having it take place within just 
the straight up Batman yeah. <laughs> numbered series. So yeah, the 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 year one tag is very synonymous with other characters throughout DC that have been like really pivotal arcs yeah. of, of the characters. So uh, I'm expecting some pretty big things from that. Yeah, it's gonna be cool. Yeah, and then and then really honestly, that's really the big news that's been coming out lately. Uh, we're we are going to talk a little bit about the Spider-Man gang war stuff that's going on because I covered. I'm going to be covering the Luke Cage book, so we'll get into that later in the episode. But um, yeah, I mean, Andy, do you have anything else news uh, that you want to you want to cover or, or any or anything? The only thing I had was Mike D sent a text to the group uh, in the last couple of weeks about a book of essays about Moon Knight mm-hmm. called Waxing and Waning. Um, probably not for everybody, <laughs> but uh, I will Big definitely, moon. <laughs> yeah, I will definitely be picking this up. Um, I I I love like. Uh, intellectual conversations surrounding uh, comic books and characters and to have one that's specifically about my boy, Mr. Knight Mm -hmm. is pretty exciting for me. So yeah. Andy's ears always perk up when there's like extra pro stuff about his, his characters (laughs) that he likes, which yeah, you know, makes perfect sense while you're a Grant Morrison fan because you're just like the headier the better, baby. Mm-hmm. Let me read. Yeah, I want to know <laughs> the inner workings of this psycho. Yeah. Uh, have you had a chance to watch? This is off track. Any of the Scott Pilgrim stuff? Oh, it's series? so good, man. We haven't started it yet, but it, I, it's just like sitting there waiting for me to devour, and I cannot uh, wait to get in. I'm that. like three episodes in, and. I won't spoil anything, but it's not an adaptation of the comic. Is it a rehashing of the movie? Like, no, it's word? not. Th- it's not that either. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then consider my uh, interest peaked. You are you are in for a treat, my friend. Um, and I'm I'm stoked to get it finished. And you know, I just read a a little. Um, little blurb from Brian Lee O'Malley saying that with the prevalence of shows being canceled after season one, uh, they weren't like developing this as a multi-season thing. Mm -hmm. They just tried to make it one, you know, one little be its own thing, um, hedging their bets that this would be canceled after season one. Um, which I imagine it's expensive to make though, with just the voice acting alone. Yeah, probably. Um, but I, I love that approach. Um, I think any movie, any show should just try and tell a story in the amount of space that you're guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Um, cause nothing ruins a show for me more than teeing up, you know, something mid season that like never pays off. Right. I hate that crap. Case in point, Firefly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Firefly. I mean, that's the, yeah. that's the definitive, just like ultimate cliffhanger. And then, like, we got a movie from it, but still there's so much left that they wanted to, so much meat left on that bone. Yeah. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, the HBO Max, like, Swamp Thing show. Oh, yeah. Like, they Did opened... Two seasons? One, and they, one? Didn't, they didn't even get to do all they wanted to do. It got canceled before the show was done filming. They didn't, like, he didn't even get to say a signature catchphrase, which I am Swamp Thing. Yeah, he, he didn't even get to say, All those that know fear burn at the touch of the Swamp Thing. Has anyone seen my donut? <laughs> I'm glad 10K is not here. The classic <laughs> swamp thing. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, let's get into the first issues. Let's do it. Um, I read Luke Cage Gang War. Hell yeah. 
which is I think the second in the gang war series that they're doing, which if you're not up to speed on what is happening, basically Luke Cage is now the mayor of New York. Uh, he ousted the kingpin or the kingpin just like kind of left um, because he was trying to be president. It's a whole thing that happened in reign of power. It was a devil's was a reign. To, devil's reign. That, that's, that's what it was. And so now Luke Cage is now mayor. There is like an anti superheroes law in New York where um, like superheroes slash citizens cannot interfere with criminal investigations or any kind of criminal involvement. And so what is now happening is that crime is now skyrocketing because everyone knows that superheroes can't do anything and the police force can only do so much. So all these B and D level villains are like carving up New York and like making their own territories and just kind of making it into um, a really unsafe place to be because they're basically going unchecked and being allowed to do whatever they want to do. Right. And so now we have this issue, which is by Rodney Barnes about Luke Cage, just like coming to terms with that and trying to figure out how as a mayor and as like, as a mayor who's supposed to uphold the law and as Luke Cage, as someone who kind of is on the, other side of the law, not really a lawbreaker, but like has to do things that he shouldn't do to like protect people. So it's kind of like this, you know, duality thing that he's, he's, he's trying to grapple with. Uh, as a side note, sorry, I wanted to confirm Rodney Barnes wrote and produced the boondocks. Yes. And American gods. Mm-hmm. One and the same. That's incredible. <laughs> And this book, it's 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 a great setup book because something that I didn't realize is that the gang war comic event is there's twenty six tie ins, <laughs> which is way too much. It's too many. Way too way too much. This thing should have been, and I'm being generous, capped at fifteen. Yeah, like. What are you? What story are you going to tell in twenty six tie-ins? That's outrageous. Yeah. That is, that's like uh, racketing. <laughs> it's like you're just like stealing money from people now. Um, so that's where my first issue with this whole thing goes. But I like the idea of like superheroes getting creative to take down the criminal element that's that's growing in New York now. And like uh, Luke Cage goes around trying to like collect new readers or not new readers, but new um, heroes to help him with his cause. So he sees uh, Cloak and Dagger. He recruits them and he's like going around talking to uh, other allies who support what he's doing to like kind of get reassurance that he's doing the right thing. He gets this new suit in the series to hide his identity, which is ridiculous looking is the, the the goofiest thing because you look at him, you go, that's Luke Cage with like a Zorro mask over it. Like no (laughs) person in their right mind, especially like a police officer who's like trained kind of to know, like pick these things out. is going to be like, it's fucking Luke Cage. Like what the fuck? Like, come on, it's the mayor. That's the mayor. (laughs) Yeah. Isn't the same guy that opened a Chipotle the other day? Like, what's he doing? Yeah. And he, he looks like he looks like Shaquille O'Neal in uh, Steel. Like, sure. that's the kind of like outfit that it is. And you're just like, that is just awful. <laughs> that is not a good suit. And um, so he's like now in that garb. Like by night, he's this character doesn't even give himself a name. And by day he's mayor, and so it's 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 going to be fun, I think, to kind of see how what teams he starts forming because Danny Rand is is palling around with them, and they're really addressing the fact that Danny Rand does not have any powers now, right? Like he's he's not the Iron Fist anymore. He's just a 
guy that knows karate and right. other kung and other martial arts. Like, um, so it's gonna be. I, I think something's gonna happen with Danny throughout this, where I I I, I don't know if his character is gonna be like kind of put into the forefront of like how a, a, a former superhero who still wants to be good, but like his main power is like taken away, how he rises to the occasion to become a quote unquote superhero. So that's sure. going to be an interesting uh, thing to watch. Um, I think by the end of this, Luke Cage will not be mayor of New York anymore. <laughs> I sure. think he'll just kind of be like, I can't be a law abiding citizen because I need to break the rules to protect people. Um, and I think, you know, with 26 tie-ins to get through, I think we're going to see a lot of, albeit pointless, some fun battles between supervillains and superheroes mixing it up in the alleyways. This is very much a street level street gang book. Uh, the one that had my interest was the Shang-Chi three issue Mm -hmm. series. Um, so it's, it's like it's it, this is a defenders series without calling it a defenders series. Totally. Yeah. Um so yeah, look forward to that. There's uh there's 26 <laughs> issues. We will not be covering all of them. It sounds it sounds like it read well though without like having to read Spider-Man and all that other stuff though, right? No, cuz I mean it's 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 the most straightforward crossover tie-in book that I think I've read in a long time of just cool. like, you know, oh, hold on. Let me, I'm going to share my screen with you real quick. This is why okay. YouTube is fun. This is the new outfit. Sharing, sharing, take your time. Right. Oh yeah, Sure. Like that's that's steel. That's Shaquille love, O'Neal in, in steel. I love his bald head just sticking out the top of it. <laughs> uh, you look at that person and go, "That's Luke Cage." Yeah, it's like, not it, like, just covering the nose and the sides of the face. Like that's Luke Cage. Give him a better outfit than that. <laughs> yeah, that is ridiculous. Oh man, that's funny though. Good yeah. times. So, what book did you cover? Mr. Vargas. Uh I read a couple of things. Um I think this came out last week. Uh but the I read uh Somna on Distillery from mm-hmm. Becky Clunan and Tula Lote. Yep. And that is a a spicy meatball. That is a horny ass book. But yeah, it's kind of uh peddled as like this one will get you hot. Yeah, and it does. Um, it's about a woman during the uh, like Salem witch, witch trials. Witch trials, yeah, yeah. Um, and she is not had, you know, her. She's in a kind of a loveless marriage or a, a, an emotionless marriage, and she is having dreams from this uh, entity, this male entity um who keeps you know drawing out her desires and and telling you know what do you want you know it's all the sexy stuff um and her husband my male counterpart yeah and her husband is the witch finder for like the town or whatever so you know issue one he like burns a witch at the stake right like just straight out the bat um while she's having these you know impure dreams whatever and the issue ends with her seemingly having brought the entity from her dreams into like the real world right oh wow yeah so uh not sure yet if she is a witch if this is a demon if this is a you know manifestation of some kind of like supernatural ability um but it it is definitely a comic for 
uh, like a certain audience, you know, like it's, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend this for everybody. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's extremely well-written. Um, but it's, it's like a Mirka and Dolfo, like there is, there is provocative imagery, but there's also a deeper story underneath all of that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, definitely. Um, you you can tell that this this book is definitely going to speak very deeply to people that are in like a similar situation, um, or anybody who's who are dating witch finders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, people who <laughs> might be witches who are you know, uh, burned at the stake. Yeah, um, but it, I mean, yeah. Well, I think uh, as we're coming to see. A lot of these distillery books are um, the the kind of the deep end of comic books. You know, mm-hmm. there's not going to be a lot of capes, uh, not going to be a, <laughs> no. a lot of kids stuff, um, some pretty Distillery serious very subjects. Much like the, 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 the thinking man's publisher. Yeah, they're, they're, they're tackling more uh, complex ideas, you know, a little little harder thinking harder harder to swallow uh uh stories than than most publishers would really go after yeah exactly this is not something that i could see them having an easy time selling even to you know boom right no um, i think this would have a hard time even on image yeah to be honest. for sure um but it's it's very good if you're if you're in the mood for like an erotic thriller, erotic horror, mm-hmm. check it out. Uh, obviously if you're a fan of Becky and uh, Tula, then for sure go for it. And you're going to love the hell out of it. For sure. It's a great book. So um, it was eight ninety nine though, which seems to be the classic. That's, that's the price point that uh, distillery is at. So was it one and done or is it like, Oh no. It's it's at least going to have another issue. Pro- I I'm guessing that all these distillery books are going to be like three or four issue mm-hmm. minis. So Okay. Yeah, I think we discussed that earlier on on an episode about Yep. the longevity of those series. Yep. Um on a lighter note, I read The Holy Roller. <laughs> yes, okay. For- so this is from Andy Samberg mm-hmm. and the guitarist of Fallout Boy, Joe Th- Joe Troman, T R O H M A N, and Rick Remender. So three writers for the price of one. <laughs> a lot of a lot of cooks in the kitchen on this. A lot block. of a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Uh, this is a forty-eight page debut for three ninety-nine. Nice. $3.99. nice. <laughs> um. And this is oh, it's so hard to explain. Okay, so the, the what it made me think of was like if you took Inglorious Bastards mm-hmm. and Rambo and okay. Batman and okay. threw it in a blender uh-huh. and then poured it in a glass made of Kingpin, the movie. Yeah. That's this book. All right. Well, all of those things are amazing, <laughs> and and mixed into one sounds even better. Yeah. So it's it's about this guy whose family are like super good at bowling, um, and he's he's a Jewish kid. Plays really heavily into the story the fact that he's Jewish, and he gives up this promising bowling career to go be in Greenpeace for like twenty years comes back to his small town and finds that it's like basically overrun with uh, anti-Semites, you know, bordering on like Mm -hmm. neo-Nazis and is immediately, he goes and visits his dad uh, who is dying. That's the reason he comes home and his dad gives him his like treasured, his prized bowling ball. 
and as the guy's walking around his town he gets jumped by like his childhood bully um oh, and beats the shit out of the bully and his cronies with this bowling, with bowling. ball yeah um and the the, the story is just going to jump out from there so i i foresee um pro- probably the dad's not going to make it <laughs> so much right and uh our hero will uh you know come unglued yeah come unglued and and um go out on a a mission of revenge but is this a uh, it has to be a mini right i don't know man um i i think kind of like read 100 issues of some guy beating up neo nazis with a bowling ball that's yeah. not a problem but yeah, I mean, my guess is that Andy Samberg probably doesn't have the bandwidth to like write an ongoing comic series. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't need to just give him the rough idea. Right. But, you know, kind of like like local man, you, you read the first mm. issue of that and you're like, wow, this is fucking great. I hope they keep it going forever. Um, this is kind of the same thing, right? Like, yeah, I'd read 100 issues of this if the story and the sales are there. So. I don't know. Um, I'm hoping that it goes on for, I don't know, maybe 12. If it was a maxi, I think would be great. Who, what publisher is this? Image. Image, yeah, okay. It's um, it's a giant generator book, Rick Remender's uh, uh, imprint. Okay. So, yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, a lot of fun. It's uh, You can tell that Andy Samberg had a lot of like input with a lot mm-hmm. of the jokes and stuff. Um, and you can also tell that, you know, Rick Remender had a lot to do with it. It's definitely his book. I, I, I don't know much about old Tom or whatever his name is. I'm, from... I'm sorry. I think we're burying that lead. The, the, the third, the third ingredient to this writing team <laughs> is the lead guitarist from fallout boy who yeah. I had no idea, uh, was a writer. Yeah. Was into comics. It's like when Taboo was on or is still writing for Marvel Comics. You're just like, yeah. where the where did this come from? Yeah, like it's just so odd. Like Andy Samberg makes complete sense. He's a writer. He's humorous. He's you know that that's that is an easy transition to make. You know, like oh, I have a I have an idea. It probably won't be a great movie or a TV show, but like you know, it could be a fun comic. Yeah, and, you know, Rick Remender just started giant generator his his publishing house under image so he's just like hey you know i'll sit down with you if you want to help like structure this thing out where does the guitars from fallout boy come in where i where did that thread get interwoven i i went on wiki and i found out that he grew up jewish um Mm -hmm. you know pretty heavy into it and then kind of fell off um but he has like i guess a pretty successful podcast about uh being like a famous musician um mm-hmm. and has written a book about his experience in that career really? uh yeah so i don't know man but uh it works it it works really well so yeah <laughs> incredibly is, fun is, book the other thing that i'm like kind of like None. It's like it's interesting and, and and kind of an inspired thing of just like you don't see many Jewish superheroes or any like you know what I mean like so to 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 have that be like in the forefront of it is like is is great because like the representation there is like just phenomenal to see and like it's it's it, it, in in mainstream comic books the the Jewish people aren't really represented a ton within that superhero realm. Yeah. Well, and, and the way that it's presented, um, you know, we, we've, we've seen a lot of like the whole alt right thing come up in comics, you know, in the last couple of years. Um, but to have like an overtly Jewish character, going up against those alt-right people is um, pretty cool, pretty daring, I, I would well, say. And I think the Inglorious Bastards comp is is pretty spot on of just like, you know, 
the oppressed destroying the oppressor revenge story is like so clutch and like just a, a, a delightful read. Yeah. I I'm interested to see if this gets like more heady than, you know, we yeah. think, cause there's, there are interpretations I'm sure of this book you could make of, Oh, a Jewish guy returns to his homeland to mm -hmm. kick out the infiltrators. Like, mm -hmm. you know, is that, is that going to play a part of this book? I don't know. Uh, I yeah. don't even know if that was intentional, but um, for, for the I, time being, <laughs> it is a very fun book. Pretty, pretty violent. I will say that, you know, it's, it's a comedy book for sure. But if you've read stuff like anything Jerry Duggan's done, <laughs> Oh, uh, sure. it's that same vein so I, I think that's why these types of books that are kind of sneaky with their message of just like you know wrapping the medicine in, in peanut butter or cheese or whatever to kind of <laughs> force down the, the hard bit yeah. are, are, are great and I think it's a, a, a clever and unique way to tell a story so I, I'm when I first saw this being solicited, I was like, oh, I'm completely in 100% whatever the fuck this is. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's it's a fun book. It's going to keep being fun. So, yeah. um, And the last one I read was X-Men Blue Origins. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a one shot from Cy Spurrier. Uh, this is ostensibly the origin of Nightcrawler, but it more is a history of mystique and irons out all of the weird, uh, like retcon stuff that we've gotten from her life throughout the years. Um, it addresses the weird you know, who is Nightcrawler's father? Uh, what's the deal with Mystique and Destiny? Um, you know, why did Mystique abandon Nightcrawler? All that stuff gets addressed in this book. Um, abandoned? She threw him off a bridge. <laughs> I, right. <laughs> or did she? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, um, and the 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 thing that I will say about this too is that it's like it's surprisingly heartfelt for, for especially for uh, revolving around mystique, right? Mm -hmm. Traditionally, extremely like kind of harsh, right? Like she doesn't have a lot of emotionality to her character, yeah, especially for Nightcrawler. Um, but it's. It's good. I, I'm a Nightcrawler super fan. He's my favorite mutant. So getting this kind of definitive origin was very cool. Um, but I think anybody who's a fan of that era of mutants, you know, the, the deadly origins stuff, mm -hmm. there's a, a ton to love here. Good. I'll, I'll check it out. I saw that it was getting some chatter on uh, social media yesterday when it came out about kind of how they're trying to not rework the retcons or the, the, the back history, but just like essentially just like iron out the wrinkles of just like, okay, let's make this a little more cohesive. Yeah. And, and that's really what it ended up being was uh Cy Spurrier just taking the pieces that we've been given, um, putting them in an order and then kind of using Charles Xavier to glue them all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And that's easy it, to do with the, with the X-Men. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's really good stuff. And like I said, uh, kind of hit me in the heart way more than I thought an origin of Nightcrawler comic book would. So really good stuff. Um, I'd love to see more of this to be perfectly honest, um, you know, getting some of those like definitive origins of some of the, the mutants that we've only been hinted at, or if their history has been 
you know, kind of retcon to death, uh, you know, Deadpool, right? Like, feels like I've heard three different origins of Deadpool and would love to see something like this, um, where it's kind of all laid out in a single continuity, you know, moving forward. Yeah, for sure. The problem with that, though, is getting everyone to agree on the background as far as editorial and creator. True. Very true. Um, But if if they can do it as successfully as this Nightcrawler book, then then, yeah, I'm with you. I say go for it. Yeah. Uh, The last book I read was called Lotus Land from Boom Studios by... Darcy Van Polgist and Caio Felipe. Uh, this book came out of left field for me. I was not expecting it. Wasn't really on my radar. Picked it up on a lark. And it threw me for a loop. It was so, so, so good. So I love you that. now. Go back to your LCS. Pick up Lotus Land. It is a futuristic book about a unique type of detective that can you know it's not really fully explained but he can like look into your mind by touching you and like seeing like your memories to like figure out what crime you've committed or or or, or what you're going to commit not like minority report style but like that he's imbued with some kind of um ability that okay. gives him a certain skill set to solve crimes in a very unique way. Who he also has a son who we find out as the story, you know, ends has the same markings as him. So it's alluded to that he has the same power, but the father it mentions throughout the book he doesn't know the son doesn't know how to hide it or control it as well as his dad yet. So it's okay. almost like kind of taking control over him or evolving into a new type of uh ability that like he hasn't seen yet. So it is it is it is hyper futurism meets classic noir meets um like parenting woes. Sure. And it is it is written so cohesively and so like beautifully that it all, all of it makes sense as you're reading it. You're just like, yeah, like fuck yeah, like this is the most no nonsense sci-fi futuristic crime story I've ever read, and that was what was so pivotal for me when I was reading this. I was just like, I get it, and not yeah. only do I get it, I want to read more stories like this. Yeah. So now I want to seek out more stories that are in this kind of genre which is sure. what books like like lotus land should do yeah it should just open the door for new readers of just like hey are you interested in this type of genre here's kind of what it is go check it out yeah so lotus land on boom studios go go check it out it was really really good beautifully drawn um the, oh the, the, the it's last from the comment, it's from yeah. the writer of Little Bird. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And Little Bird was awesome. <laughs> yeah. So it's it it was phenomenal. And the, the like the last thing I'll say about it is there's flying cars in it. We have to stop that. No more. We're never gonna cars. have fly. We're never gonna have flying cars ever. Even if it, this this book is set in the year twenty six thirty two or something <laughs> like that, we're never gonna have flying cars. Stop teasing us with the flying. Cars. I love the imagery of it. You know, Science Scientific America did it so many years ago in their yeah. magazine from nineteen nine uh, uh, nineteen forty two or whatever. We're never going to have flying cars. We're never going to have personal jetpacks. The future <laughs> is a lie. Okay, it's fun, but it's not going to happen. Yeah, stop teasing us with it. Seriously, fiction. I'm I'm tired of it. Go back. Go backwards. Go back All to horse-drawn f- carriages in the future. Yeah, I want fucking Flintstones cars. I want to be able to stop a car with my dirty feet. At least that's more realistic than a hover car. True. It just makes me so mad when I see that stuff. Because, like, 
because you want one so badly. The future should be so bright, but it's just just chock full of lies. (laughs) It's just chock full of lies, isn't it? Always. That's my that's my only knock on Lotus Land. They're they're perpetuating the lie of flying car technology. (laughs) In this in a sci-fi comic. In a sci-fi comic. How dare they? I'm okay with the telepathy. I'm okay with the the power that is that is cryptic that reads someone's mind. Flying cars is where I draw the line. <laughs> and I'm going to draw the line on this episode because I think we've done it, Andy. We we did it again. We piloted another four-wheeled episode of First Issue Club <laughs> to its destination, and that destination is the end. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We'll be back next week. Will we have Mike D? Will we not? Tune in and find out. Until then, be safe. Bye.